Today, I am having a conversation with Arno Brandt, the CEO of Kratomic. For those of you that don't know yet, Kratomic is one of the very few up and coming graphite players with very interesting properties in both Namibia and in Brazil. We will be talking all about graphite, Kratomic, and of course, plenty of other topics. So now, let's get into it. So, I would like to now welcome you, Arno Brandt, to the channel. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Stein. Thank you for having me and thank you for your continuous support. Sure, sure. Awesome. So to start the conversation, could you perhaps tell us a bit about yourself and maybe dive a bit deeper on your backstory and how you became the CEO of Cortomic? Sure. Depending on how much time we have today, it could be a very long, very short story. A couple of minutes would be perfect. I was the original founder of the Alcon Graphic Deposit in Libya in 2012. Um, I stayed on as a project manager on the on the project at that point in time. I was working for a boutique bank as a chief metals uh, head of metals and uh, energy trading uh, for a company called uh, Boswell Capital, um, Boswell International. Um, particularly, you know that firm was probably the largest or second largest uranium trader broker in Canada. Um, we for a bunch of utilities. So at that point in time, it was not possible for me to uh, endeavor to take on a CEO or officer role. We continued to steer the project forward from a you know, consulting basis, project manage management perspective during the course of 2012 over through to 2016. Uh, 2016, I retired. Um, I joined with a former partner of mine called Sheldon Inventosh. Um, at that point in time, we became co-CEOs, um, you know, spent a lot of time and effort in Gratomic and uh, building up the pilot facility at that time on the Outcome Graphic Line. Um, we did a lot of research and development into the graphene industry at that time until we realized, you know, the graphene industry really isn't poised yet to, uh, you know, have that massive acceleration of, uh, you know, graphite into the market. Um, so we steadily, you know, stopped uh, putting money into the graphene R and D. Uh, it's not that we completely sidelined it. It's just you know there's you know so many graphene companies out there that you can pick from. Um, you know, 2020 in March, I you know took over as CEO of the company, and uh, you know that's when we did our original capex raise to start building out the Alcon Graphite project and I've been here ever since. That's an amazing story, quite a rich history for sure. Um, how do you think your experience in those other ventures you've done before helps you out in your current role? Well, you know what, I had an incubation business um, for a long time while I was working with the boutique bank um, next to my uh, nuclear trading that we were doing on the side. The incubation um, company really got me going around the world looking at assets um, and uh, you know we put together quite a few companies um, during the course of my career you know gave me in-depth understanding of what to look at in an asset in order to you know for that asset to be to stand a chance at making it through into uh, production <clears throat> you know we've been fairly successful we've built quite a few mines around the world. Um, you know, the understanding how to structure offtakes between end users, <clears throat> between end users and um, miners really gave me an in-depth understanding on, uh, you know, how the commercial aspect of the business works. It really gives you proper understanding on how to read market trends. Um, you know, you want to be in the market at the right time and you want to set offtakes at the right time. Yeah, you know, whenever you're in an appreciating market, it's definitely the perfect time, you know, to go and set long-term contracts. Uh, markets aren't always um, as lofty as they are today. You know, eventually they start turning. So appreciating markets is probably the miner's best friend. That's exactly what we're seeing today. It gives you the power and control to set contracts, um, long-term off-take arrangements. And, you know, that's exactly where we are at this point in time and just waiting for the opportune mo moment during this massive market acceleration and graphite pricing. And uh, you know, seeing which, which, uh, which of the uh, partners are willing to pay most. 
That's amazing. I really like that. And that appreciating market really fits into what I was going to ask you next. Uh, I was going to focus on graphite, of course, the commodity that Cortomex specializes in. Could you perhaps explain, in your opinion, why graphite is such a great investment opportunity and maybe go a bit deeper into why graphite is needed? And what are some of your expectations for graphite demand heading into the future? So the graphite market has uh, you know, several aspects that makes it very interesting. Um, let's start with let's start with the uh, critical metals and minerals list. Um, you know, U.S. critical mineral metals and minerals um, list out there. Um, focus on uh, you know every single mineral on that list or metal on that list. Um, these minerals essentially are the key components that make up you know um, battery battery materials that go into one of the fastest growing global markets out there, which is the EV battery industry. You know, we look at, uh, you know, we look at a worldwide market where you have, uh, you know, a few billion cars driving around the world, um, you know, with internal combustion engines. You know, it's a long road <laughs> to slowly phase those out and uh, replace them with electric vehicles, which is the ultimate benefit to everybody that walks this planet. Um, so yeah, I mean, graphite is the one component in that car which is not recyclable. Um, you know, you can recycle almost every single other metal in the battery other than graphite. So uh, why, is, why is graphite the most interesting one? Well, it makes, all, you know, makes up almost 60% of the battery. And uh, you know, there's very few, very few miners out there that can actually you know, go from mine to market. And uh, you know, we look at how many mines came into circulation since 2012. And I can count uh, two, three. Right now, the world is on a trend where you're going to have to bring on a massive producer on an annual basis, and in order to simply keep up with uh, demand. And uh, you know, synthetic graphite is there on the side. Um, synthetic graphite is great. It's got the it's got the uh, you know energy energy capacity, um, but it can never ever compete with natural graphite in terms of energy density on the anode side. So uh, every battery in the world is still going to have to have a sprinkled mix of uh, synthetic and, and synthetic and natural graphite. And uh, yeah, I, I see that as the perfect um, opportunity for uh, you know, a company like Gratomic to go find you know, best-in-class assets around the world and uh, you know, really focus on uh, hitting it home with uh, bringing on you know, one mine you know every 18 months or so. makes a lot of sense and i think you explained it in a very concise and uh, easy to understand manner so thank you for that um mm -hmm. so from your story i understand that electric vehicles are the biggest driver for graphite demand and are you recognizing any other potential sources of graphite demand too or is that just the main one that you're focusing on for now so in general the world demand for graphite is steadily on an uptick of about six percent a year um, we see a continuous increase of you know, about 60, 70, 60, 70 thousand tons of graphite a year to 100,000 tons of graphite a year, uh, which is the equivalent of um, you know, either three small operations or uh, one significantly large operation. Um, that demand is primarily still driven by you know, crucibles, um, electrodes, um, you go into refractory lubricants and graphitic foil. There's a lot of a uh, lot of graphite applications that, uh, out there that steadily drive demand for the up, uptick in uh, well prices. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, graphitic foil demand starts kicking up again. It's uh, tightly correlated to you know commodity markets in general. Um, you know geothermal well casings, same story. If you uh, you know, it's a great insulator out there. So, uh, you know, it's a perfect, perfect uh, material to use in geothermal wall casings. Um, it really depends on, you know, which sector of the market is expanding, but uh, we see a continual increase of about 6% six, 6 per year. And uh, the graphite, well, the anode market as a class within the graphite um, space is increasing, you know, it's expected to increase you know, probably about 
three or four fold over the next uh, five to 10 years. So it has a very attractive case um, for in many regards, but uh, the electric vehicle industry is just gonna you know, overshadow any other application. That is uh, quite amazing to be able to pick your, uh, pick your brain regarding the bull case for graphite. But of course, there's also the other side of the coin. There's also uh, the bear case we should talk about. Um, two concerns I often hear online are solid state batteries as the first one and different potential anode materials as the second one. Could you perhaps dive a bit deeper into those two, what are your opinions of those threats are, and do you think they are serious enough to impact traffic demand heading into the future? So solid state batteries is a technology that, you know, still requires a lot of research. Um, a company like Ritomic obviously has its eyes squarely on that market. Um, you know, it requires, still requires graphite um, to a certain degree. Um, but, uh, you know, how much, you know, we probably wouldn't know for some time until it's actually a real commercial concept. But, um, but, uh, you know, we, we keep our minds fairly open to all new technologies coming in. And, uh, you know, um, you look at silicon batteries. Yes, they're great. Um, you know, silicon is a known additive in, you know, natural anodes that are used in lithium-ion batteries today. It's no secret. Um, it's a great material. Um, you know, once they come up with the, you know, pristine formula on how to contain that massive expansion index on silicon. I probably you imagine that it will be a very successful anode material. But again, the world's not there yet. I mean, it's just a fairly small market. And, uh, you know, for now we stick with what works. And, uh, you know, the thing that will probably end up working best, as we've seen in the past, is a combination um, of, you know, graphite material and sil silicon material together in a battery. And uh, that's, that's, of course, the perfect, perfect uh, hybrid. Right? They have both great characteristics to add. And, uh, you know, why not? Um, you know, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of expense, um, you know, opportunity in the market. And uh, the more technologies come on board, um, the better. And uh, we just make sure that uh, graphite forms the basis of it. <laughs> so now we've crossed off graphite as a commodity. Let's focus on Cortomic as a business. Um, a lot of the viewers might not be intimately familiar with Cortomic. So could you perhaps explain the two facilities you're currently constructing um, in Namibia? Um, by, by all means, yeah. So uh, you know, the outcome graphite, vein, vein graphite acid in Namibia is one of the highest grade um, graphite acids in the world. Um, it's a very, very unique deposit that, uh, you know, offers quite a dramatically high grade um, coming out of coming out of the uh, old workings, and uh, the processing plant that was constructed on outcome was built up to be about twenty thousand tons per year of output capacity. It's a very unique plant. It's one of the few plants in the world that was constructed to take graphite to anode anode grade material without the aid of heat treatment or acid treatments. The uh, you know, we're fairly fairly advanced into the commissioning of the processing plant. Commissioning, of course, is the stage just before you go into pre-production. Um, you know, legally, you can't say you're in production until you hit a fifty-one percent fifty-one percent of your production capacity. So, uh, what we're doing basically right now is making sure every single component of the plant is functioning properly. Um, you know, every, every piece of equipment is, you know, calibrated properly to treat the material as it should. It's a very complicated process. It's probably, you know, each piece of equipment probably has like a few hundred different criteria to check off before you can start up the machine. <laughs> and then once you start it up, you've got to calibrate it. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a run back and forth with logs between pilot facility versus uh, actual facility make sure that uh, you're doing things right. So Arno, real quick, this is all for the Alcon processing plant where you take the raw faint graphite and turn it into a graphite product, right? Correct, yes. This is all the first stage of that processing facility. Just call it primary beneficiation, right? So this is taking graphite from 
a head grade of 45% to 55% and introducing it to that processing facility through means of flotation to take that out to about 98.7 to 99% graphite. This is all first phase processing. Now, how come we do two phases of processing? One is wet, one is dry. So after this graphite product runs through the wet circuit, it comes into the dry circuit. And the dry circuit basically um, is where the real magic happens. Uh, we partnered with a you know, company that has provided us with a patented technology that we're licensing. Um, you know, in, in terms of air classification, um, which essentially uses the aerodynamics of a certain flake of that graphite and only floats off within that air classification system, the, you know, purest of the pure graphite that comes off at the top and everything that doesn't meet that purification level goes out at the bottom. You know, the bottom stuff, you know, grades 97, 98%, that goes to that 6% market um, 6% annual growth market that we talked about earlier, which is more conventional market, you know, welcome to lubricants, welcome to brake pads, crucibles, refractories. What comes out at the top, cream of the crop, nice expensive material. And, you know, that's shipped off to the gigafactories all around the world, right? And, uh, you know, that air classification technology is actually the single most thing that I'm excited about at the company because it's uh, it's something that you can now go and apply to similar projects around the world. So when we went after Cap and Grosso in Brazil, um, we found a project with very unique characteristics, very similar to what we saw in Outcome. Uh, it's always the beauty of the evolution of a mining company, right? You can set out, step out, and you learn your deposit type. You perfect that deposit type. And then you go around the world and you look to replicate what you have that you know works. And we found that in Cap and Grosso. And, uh, you know, companies like Gritomic can now go into Cap and Grosso, which is more of a conventional crossover between flake graphite and vein graphite and uh, extremely high grade deposit. You know, we're sitting there with uh, almost three times commercial grade and extremely long stripe very, very good continuity in the graphite, uh, very soft material at surface, all economic contributors that make, uh, you know, graphite companies like us smile because it has the attributes to fit into that lower portal of a cost curve. And then you come in and you introduce that air classification technology to, uh, to that particular circuit. And, uh, you know what did you end up with is a beautiful, beautiful closed circuit of, uh, you know, 99% graphite coming out at the lower co possible cost curve. And uh, we're currently, you know, in Toronto, busy organizing the metallurgical test work for Cup and Grosso. My guess is it will probably be very, very close to what we're seeing in outcome. And, uh, you know, the only thing better than one outcome is two outcomes, right? So... <laughs> That's amazing. That's uh, great to hear. You already start, started talking about Captain Prosa, which I was going to ask you about in just a bit, but you gave us so many insights that I didn't want to uh, stop you. Um, you haven't really touched on Ludridge Bay just yet. Could you perhaps explain that facility in a bit more detail? Well, the, uh, the best way to describe it, Stein, is, uh, you know, once you step out to become a money company, Right. You got to, you know, have a perspective on how do I add more value for shareholders, right? Because you're going to get to that $3,400 price point and you're not going to get much further than that on your mining circuit, right? So our job is maximize the value on the mine, which is $3,400 a ton. So imagine you have 20,000 tons coming out of outcome here. 40,000 tons coming out of Capo Grosso a year, have bring in a few other magic, um, magic projects, you know, to double, triple that over the next 10 years. That's all fantastic, right? But how do you get that multiple out? Mm -hmm. And the multiple comes when, you know, good people go around doing good things by expanding themselves 
as far up the added manufacturing chain as you possibly can. And, uh, you know, added value manufacturing adds value to a multiple degree for shareholders. So Ludritz is exactly that. We're going to take our beautiful outcome product as it comes out of the air classification system. We're going to move it over to the Ludritz facility. You know, we're going to tinker with it and uh, turn it into an industrial park where, you know, you now produce micronized and swearinized and art, you know, um, altered la atomic layer deposition material, um, you know, really play with it to add that multiple and take it from 3,400 to 8,000 to, you know, 12,000 to $15,000 ton material. And then, uh, you know, we're right on the port, a berth away from, you know, opening up old lines of, uh, you know, dollar signs to the rest of the world. And, uh, you know, that's essentially why the Just Bay is there. I mean, we are very quickly becoming one of the largest landholders in the, in the city. So <laughs> not, not done yet. Oh, that is uh, quite amazing. Great to hear your insights on this matter. And um, perhaps you can share a bit more on the timeline, timelines regarding Alcom's development as well as Lurich Bay, if, if that's possible. So my Alcom development, as far as I'm concerned today, is, you know, hopefully we start seeing dollars turning out in Q1, Q2 this year. Um, you know, it's quick enough. It's faster than any other company could have done. It. Um, you know, we've, we've really put our heads down and work, worked our butts off continue to do so. Um, Digital space is really a three-year plan. Um, so right now what we're starting to do is do the general layout, do the general design of an industrial park where we can really come in and tinker with the graphite after processing. I really focus on that anode material post-processing. Our partners at Forge Nano, um, which we'll probably discuss later, um, you know, they, they're really gonna help us a lot with that. Um, looking forward to using that ALD technology in Lidritz and, uh, of course, uh, hopefully facilitate that through, uh, you know, means of uh, solar power, keep that, uh, keep that footprint nice and clean and uh, so on and so forth. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, those are actually two questions I uh, was going to ask you. Solar power, which you, of course, released in the news report for in April 2021, I believe. Could you perhaps share the current state of affairs regarding solar power and uh, Alcom? So, uh, you know, I, I, I really got to thank the world for the greener push. Because, uh, you know, it really made us look at alternative technologies in terms of power generation. You know, solar has two major benefits for Gratomic. You know, it takes us away from diesel, which is expensive as hell and uh, puts us into something that's closer to five cents a kilowatt hour. Yeah, so thank you for the green push, but it also really reduces, um, you know, carbon emissions and brings the outcome, you know, something to be something that's really close to all of our hearts and is leaving a better tomorrow for all our kids and uh, future generation. Right? So uh, it definitely forms a major part of our principles and values in the company. That is awesome. And you all also already started talking about Forge Nano. Perhaps you could dive a bit deeper in the partnership you guys, uh, Cortomec and Forge Nano, are having and what that ALD layer coding enables you to do with your products. So, uh, you know, no, no surprise. Cortomec is a very forward looking company. We like, you know, keeping our eyes on the future in terms of changes that are happening. Um, in, in our space. And uh, Forge Nano was exactly that, right? And Forge Nano was that beautiful technology that came in that could replace traditional carbon coating. And for me, that is critical. Once again, it takes away from dirty, you know, dirty and yucky and brings it into the world of uh, clean tech, which is, you know, really something that sits well with our principles and value and values within the company. And, um, you know, it's a, no surprise that Volkswagen and LG Chem made a significant investment into Forge Nano and a partnership into Forge Nano. And, uh, you know, we're, we're striving away. There's a lot of surprises in terms of, uh, you know, bringing that 
technology to the market um, in the next three years. Um, you know, guys are going to have to sit tuned and stay tuned and watch what we do. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's probably going to be something that keeps people surprised and interested in the years to come. Well, that is um, quite amazing once again. We've already talked about uh, the two facilities in um, Namibia, but of course, aside from Namibia, Protomic also has its eyes set on an additional property in Brazil uh, called Capim Grosso. You've already started talking about this property just a bit ago. Um, is there anything you want to add regarding the importance of this most recent acquisition to Cortomics, um assets? Yeah. Well, we took a very aggressive approach on Capim Grosso. Um, you know, it's a big play of the rumble in the jungle, I guess, uh, a place where there's no trees. But, uh, you know, really hitting it hard with the drilling right now, you know, we're very, very impressed with the initial three programs we ran on the property and just kept going and hitting it with trenching and sampling. And, uh, you know, it couldn't stop because it was one of those things, the graphite just kept creeping along every trench. And uh, very excited right now to drill that uh, massive graphite body that we can see it's dropping out its surface. Um, you know, we're you know, hoping that that 5,000 meter drilling program, you know, could accelerate its way through, you know, Q1 into Q2. And, uh, you know, we have, if we, play our, if we play our cards right, hopefully, you know, there's something to report on that before mid-year. And, uh, you know, definitely looking forward to that. That would, of course, be amazing news. And for the viewers, Captain Grosso is obviously not a fully complete mine just yet. Arno, maybe you could answer what, in your opinion, is the most critical information and news we investors should watch out for in regarding to uh, exploration and early mine development, especially for this Captain Grosso property. Well, the uh, it's always a tough one because as an investor, you want to, you know, this is generally four or 500 graphic projects out on the market. And, uh, you know, it's the one thing that really makes sense for us from our perspective when we walk onto a project like Capo Grosso. You know, the, there's a couple of factors that really play a dramatic part in qualifying it as a gratomic asset. And if it's not a gratomic class asset, we walk away. And uh, I tell you, we looked at 120, 180 of these things. And we walked away because it just doesn't make sense. Uh, we have some very, very, very smart people. Um, you know, you pull out the canvas and the finger paint and you be creative and you come up with some great synergies and ideas. You go and test them in the field and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. But eventually you stumble upon something like Cap and Grosso, something that is a neutral jurisdiction, you know, where, you know that is mining friendly. By our province is one of the you know most mining friendly provinces in the world. You know, thank God. And this is also one of the biggest mining communities. So number two, you want to have the grade. You know, don't play around with things that are grading two, three, four, five percent graphite. You are wasting your time. The economic grade nine out of ten times for graphite is six point eight percent and up. Right. Do not waste your time with anything under that. Like, why would you waste your time trying to mine something that is, you know, sub-economic grade? You know, most graphite mines that are mining today, you know, if they're 4%, they're marginal. Marginal. You lose money most times of the year. 5%, they're still suffering. You know, markets take a little bit of a dip, you're out of the money. And you also got to consider dilution and strip. Um, you know, if the strip ratio and the dilution, you know, is not attractive, um, you know, run and run for the hills as fast as you can because you're just never, ever going to be able to beat Mother Nature, right? So when we look at these deposits, you know, we really focus on, you know, first of all, the grade, the jurisdiction, you know, the continuity of the resource. Um, unless it's something of a vein deposit that, you know, you know, starts at like a 90 little per, 90% little vein, like, you know, propelling its way to surface, like 30 meter widths, then, uh, you know, I don't mind dilution in a case like that because you're mining black coal. But, uh, 
in terms of Capo Grosso, <laughs> you know, it, it really ticked all the boxes and very low dilution, very low waste, you know, sets that surface, it's all you know, it, it really, really ticked all the box, boxes. And then it comes to the most important thing in mining, which is metallurgy. You know, if you, you know, don't buy something unless the metallurgy works, because uh, you know, I've been, my history as an incubator, you know, sit, sat on deposits to the scale of three or four billion tons. And uh, before we did anything, we went through metallurgy. And, uh, you know, if the metallurgy didn't work, you know, run for the hills. Because why are you doing that? Like, if you can't process it, ignore it. <laughs> because, it's, you know, it's nothing but a purple unicorn. Yeah. yeah. Just, just walk away and focus on the creep. Key credentials that make deposits real. Awesome. Thanks for your insights regarding that. Um, so, as an investor, we should mainly focus on the drilling results. Is that what I'm hearing from you regarding this? Well, focus on metallurgy. Um, metallurgy. Look at the drilling, of course. Um, you know, of course, at Outcome, we did things completely backwards. Um, you know, we drilled initially and uh, got a very high sense of confidence that the graphite is fairly continuous in nature. We're drilling it now still. Um, it's one of those deposits that, you know, probably drill for the rest of my life um, and never finish drilling because it's just, it's a very robust asset. <laughs> so it's, it's funny how it works, but eventually, you know, once we drill out enough, you know, kilometers, um, you know, you'll have a fairly accurate assessment of what is there. And once you have that accurate assessment, you bring it to the market. I mean, we're not scared. We're not, you know, we're not really worried about, um, you know, what is to come because we know that what we have is incredibly robust. I mean, we're still hitting graphite 240 meters down the uh, outcome, right? So, and how come we could afford to do it in reverse because we could see the graphite petering out 350 meters in front of us on the hill. And uh, that gives you a great, great sense of confidence. Um, you know, also have the lower adits, which is, gives you a perfect three-dimensional perspective of how the geology works. And uh, so we could actually afford to, you know, do it in reverse because we, you know, we could see initially that we had up uh, to 20 years of sustainable mine life. And, uh, you know, now as we're drilling deeper and deeper, deeper into the, uh, you know, into the earth, we start realizing that, you know, this is quite a, quite an extensive structure. <laughs> but uh, drill results are very important, of course. You know, without drilling, um, you know, where are you going to go? Like, it's, uh, it's your guide. Is your guide um, to the unknown, um, unless there is a known, um, like we have an outcome, which is a three-dimensional known, which is the equivalent of a person standing in a massive draw hole. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks for your insights regarding this. Um, like you just said, in at Alchem, you did it all the way around. You first constructed the process processing plant and then started doing the uh, classic mining studies. Is this also what we can expect from you uh, regarding Capim Grosso or what is well, the plan the of the are, Yeah, so the two are incredibly different in nature. Um, Capim Grosso, of course, is you know, not a vein graphite deposit. It's, it's, it's probably a hybrid between vein and flake. Um, at Outcome today, you know, we, we did drill it historically before we started. As soon as we had the necessary confidence internally to switch over and focus on metallurgy, which at that point became more important than, you know, if you have enough material for 10 years, you know, stop, <laughs> just stop. Don't focus on, you know, the metallurgy because that is the next important thing, right? So, you know, we kind of, we didn't turn a blind eye to drilling because we had a three-dimensional perspective on drilling. Just vein graphite deposits are very difficult to drill. They take a very long time to drill. And, uh, you know, conventional flake deposits are much easier because they're more naturally like bodies. Uh, veins are 
you know, systems that come up like this where they're crossed and sometimes go down two, three kilometers, right? So uh, it makes a very, very, it makes two very different investment criteria for a company like Atomic. Carbon Grosso is a lot easier to drill that company. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, as an investor, but also on this YouTube channel, we are constantly looking for competitive advantages. Competitive advantages, sorry. So, in the words of Warren Buffett, looking for companies with durable modes. Arno, what is, in your opinion, Cortomic's biggest current competitive advantage, or perhaps a competitive advantage you are developing for the future? Well, the, you know, we don't like competing with others because we don't like making others look bad. But, um, you know, essentially, um, essentially uh, when you look at it, it's the one thing that sets Gratomic aside from everybody else in the world is we have a hyper, hyper focus on lower quartile cost curve assets. Nobody else has, you know, sat down and tried to figure out that the only people that ever make money and control the commodity are the guys that sit on the lower quartile of the cost curve, right? So then you control the price and you control the commodity. That's basically <clears throat> one number one criteria for Gratomic. You know, we sit there, nobody else is going to even, you know, you know, come close. So in graphite, that essentially means you're sitting between 180 to $295 um, a ton of operating costs on a C1 cash basis. Very low cash cost. Um, that's, of course, through that primary beneficiation stage. We're not talking about sub, uh, secondary and tertiary upgrading. Um, so we're not talking from 98 to 99. We're talking from 55 or 17 to 90, 97, 98, 99. So that is our number one, you know, um, I would say that is our number one, you know, competitive edge against everybody else. In the market. We have a hyper-focus on those type of assets. And then we have you know, the equivalent of a superhero team that can just, you know, it's like the bloody Justice League of graphite companies, right? It's just, you know, go out and, you know, take on every single challenge the world throws at it. And we step out and step in. And next thing you know, you know, the guys are throwing concrete and uh, you're in a December period in reaching into January, you wipe your eyes out and, you're in June and you've got half the processing plant standing. Yeah, there's I yet to meet another company in the world that can achieve it. I mean, I'm very, very impressed with the leadership team and the management team. You know, absolutely world class. And uh, you know, I'm but a you know CEO at the top, I'm yapping away all day on the phone. But uh, you know, these are the guys that really, really work hard and uh, put it and give it their all and motivate it to success. And, uh, you know, without these people in our lives, you know, it becomes an empty shell. But yeah, those are our two main competitive advantages. Well, that is amazing. Management for sure is extremely important and that hyper-focus uh, sure sounds important too. Would you say Fain Graphite is an inherent competitive advantage of Cryptomic 2? Or how is your view regarding that? Well, Fain Graphite definitely adds one component of competitiveness, and it's, and it's great. Um, but then again, it falls into that same old typical structure, lower quartile of a cost curve that keeps its crystallinity, it keeps its uh, you know, order of carbon throughout the entire circuit. It processes from 55 to 99% like this. You know, we throw some water on it, jump on it, step on it, and then it's 98%. <laughs> <laughs> But graphite, big graphite has amazing competitive advantages when it comes to, you know, um, when it comes to being able to upgrade that material to, you know, the desired quality that you want. And it preserves its pristine qualities as it goes forward. I really like that analogy of throwing water and jumping on it and all of a sudden it's 98%. That is really funny. Um, then if it's search easy material to work with and has so many advantages compared to other, for, so, other forms of graphite. Why is Cryptomic one of the only companies outside of Sri Lanka that's actually focusing on fan graphite? 
Well, it's, it's just a really difficult thing to find. I mean, we find it in a couple of places around the world. Um, I mean, you got to think about vein graphite as a commodity class. You kind of have to look at it from a perspective where, you know, you know, the gods of geology came and opened up the Earth's crust, and uh, you have a swell of hydrothermal fluids rushing through that system, and uh, you have carbon dioxide and methane you know, fighting its way up the system to the point where it hits an amb ambient um, pressure and temperature gradient where it drops from 1200 to 800 degrees Celsius and it precipitates as perfectly pure carbon. It's nothing like it in this world. Um, but oh God, how many places in this world can you go where you found uh, you find a case where the gods stripped open the earth's crust and, uh, you know, brought up, brought up these hydrothermal fluids. Um, that precipitate out your carbon. A very, very difficult thing to find. We find it in minute, minute quantities, right? I've seen it in Canada, like two or three or four centimeters widths. And, uh, you know, you see it in 20 centimeters width in Canada, and you see these prospectors doing somersaults and running around and being very excited because it's, it's really difficult to find. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And perhaps you can also dive a bit deeper into, from an investment perspective, what the biggest difference between a flake graphite and a vein graphite deposit really is, like I said, from an investment perspective. From an investment perspective, you know, that comes down to probably, you know, the most interesting thing about vein graphite is the purity that it occurs in the ground. You know, 55%, 95% head. I mean, flake graphite, 1.2% to 12%. Um, sometimes you get lucky and you hit 22%, but, uh, you know, good luck processing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's generally affiliated with a ton of sulfides. Um, and sulfides is you're not your friend in this industry. So, uh, you yeah. know. Um, so you want to continue talking about the difference between flake and vein graphite? Absolutely. So, uh, in the case of vein graphite, it occurs naturally within the crust. You know, you know these pristine, you know, absolute gorgeous, you know, mineralized systems that run up to ninety-five percent graphite. I mean, it's very, very difficult to find them around the world, and uh, yeah, they're generally, you know, very easily processable. You can process them from, you know. 55% to 99% very, very easily, very, very quickly. Um, so your CapEx is probably get a CapEx advantage when you have such a lovely project. Now, in the terms of flake graphite deposits, um, although there's some of them that are, you know, really, really easy to process, um, but, you know, you get a better chance of finding purple pastry, right? It's very difficult, very difficult to find these beautiful types of deposits and flake graphite deposits. And the problem is they're great, 1.2% to 22%. They're very seldom in my life have I seen deposits, uh, flake graphite deposits from all that 22% graph. So uh, <clears throat> in this particular case, um, you know, vein is just the superior, you know, natural occurring graphite um, to mine in the industry. Makes sense. So it all comes back to purity and how easy it is for metallurgy to uh, to occur. Um, we've thus far we've talked about uh, Arkham and Captain Crosser, but of course there's also this third property uh, Cortomic has its right to called Buckingham. Could you perhaps explain the current uh, state of affairs regarding Buckingham, Buckingham, and what are your plans uh, for this property in the future? So we did inherit. Uh... Buckingham with uh, the company that we did an RTO you know, back in 2014. Um, you know, we originally did spend, have an obligation to spend some flow through capital. And we spent that money uh, fairly well. We drilled the deposit. It does have a fairly high grade head grade. Um, it's, it's a very attractive asset. It's got a scale to it. Um, Right now, as it sits, we are probably going to start making some advancements on it again, starting in, in probably late spring and to early summer. 
Barbies plan to plan to spend another two million dollars drilling her out, and uh, there should be a lot of uh, yeah, there should be a lot of exciting results coming out of what is about to happen on that particular project. And uh, hopefully, I get to share that with you guys sooner than later. That four shares sounds really exciting. Um, something else technical that I want to ask you, in, in a recent news report, Kortomik um, talked about the coin cell batteries that you guys are uh, testing with your special kind of uh, graphite. Could you perhaps explain the importance of these testings with these batteries and also uh, tell what we inf- investors can expect from this? We continue to get back interesting results, but, uh, you know, in a good old Kortomik fact, you know, our peers would have probably put up many press releases over the course of this, you know, singular test. Um, you know, we wait to get conclusive data and then bring it to the market when, you know, the data is, you know, fairly, you know, you know, it's fairly complete. You don't don't come to the market with, you know, fractional data sets because it, uh, it, it you know, really takes away from, you know, the concise system managing of shareholders. And it, it starts looking like you're trying to promote your company instead of your company. Well, that is a really admirable trade from uh, my perspective as an investor. Um, as an almost close to this conversation, to anyone watching, perhaps you don't like myself, or maybe a little bit further along in your life journey, could you perhaps give your number one piece of advice for them? But that's a unique that's a unique approach. <laughs> I like it. It's fantastic. Thank I mean, you. The number one piece of advice to anybody is just keep working. Um, keep working hard. Um, make sure you surround yourself with uh, you know, good people doing good things. And, uh, you know, just just never give up. Just keep going, man. It's the, it's the only thing that, uh, you know, sets people that are successful apart from the rest. It's you know, people that persist and persevere. And, uh, you know, the weak will often falter and fall. And, uh, you know, the strong will keep going. There you go. That is for sure a great way to end it. Any final thoughts from your end, Arno, regarding this conversation? No, no, I'm uh, very happy to finally had the opportunity to uh, uh, face the uh, Stein. I've always been, I've always admired your YouTube channel. Uh, thank you very much for all the you know, good work that you spread about Gritomic and the hard work which we're doing. And, uh, you know, really, really admiring, admire having people like you in our corner, uh, for sure. Thank you so much for those kind words. And with that said, thank you for watching. Peace.